I am live. I am reading out of Lord of the Horizon. It's one of seven uh, car memory novels or books by Joan Marshall Grant. They are her memories. This is her life as Ra'ab, who we met in the eyes of Horus. This place in ancient Egypt before the time of the flood. Um, and uh, I have been reading about Rahab and his relationship with Pharaoh Amamemet. Uh, we are now in the second part of the book and uh, we are in chapter six of that entitled Sudden Death. Though I frequently sent to Amamemet detailed reports of Sanusert's improvement, he never expressed a wish to see his son. Nearly two years after Sanuset had come to the Oryx, I received a message from Pharaoh saying that his vizio, or his visor, was about to visit me, bearing news of importance. I was surprised that the visor should be employed as a carrier of messages and decided that the real purpose of his visit must be to see the character of the royal hair, if it had improved. The vizier had been a member of the household of Aman Mehmet's father, and though I had only met him on formal occasions, I knew him to be a man of excellent judgment. The children shared the evening meal with us, and I was relieved that Sanuset showed no sign of relapsing into one of his now very infrequent moods of ill temper. He had acquired some of Beckett's attachment to animals, and a gazelle which, had recent, which I had recently given him followed him wherever he went. They had been on the river all day, being taught by my master boatman how to sail. They had taken fishing lines with them, and to honour their prowess, the fish they had caught were served to us that evening. When the children had gone to bed, the vizier said to me, The oryx is fanned throughout Egypt for its wisdom. Neither, never was fame more justified, for it has given Egypt an heir worthy of her. You are pleased with the boy's progress? Pleased? What a mar narrow word to describe so wide a gratitude. I'm glad that your support will relieve your, his father's anxiety. You came here for that purpose? Only indirectly. I came to bring you news with which Pharaoh preferred not to trust to an ordinary messenger. You need no longer watch the boundary for spies sent by Somerset's grandmother. She died suddenly, thereby making the original purpose of my visit unnecessary. How did her death affect your purpose? I was coming to tell you that she had at last discovered that Sanusad is here. She was coming to the Oryx disguised as an exile, thinking so to betray your boundless hospitality for the unfortunate. She had every confidence that she would be able to reassert her influence over Sanusad once she was able to see him again. I was to tell you that the boy should be closely watched, even though that might seriously interfere with the freedom of his education. You said she died suddenly. Do you know from what cause? Such deaths are not uncommon. Only the opportunist of its occurrence made her death at all remarkable. One might almost describe it as a case of divine intervention. The gods are not always so willing to adjust their plans for the convenience of mortals. I knew that he had wished he could have told me more. His face was bland and his manner confidential, but I knew that it would be useless to ply him with further questions. His visit was of necessary brief, of necessity brief, for his office gave him small opportunity for leisure. We parted with many expressions of mutual esteem, but my curiosity remained unsatisfied. I said to Mary, as we walked back from the river, I don't believe that the Babylonian died a natural cause. The vizier has well earned his name, father of discretion. He would never sow the seed of suspicion except deliberately. Do you think that he murdered her or that she killed herself? Said Mary, asked Mary. I think she's it is unlikely that she killed herself. Why should she when her plans to come here were already made? Neither do I think that the vizier killed her. Oh, I didn't mean that he had done it himself, only that he had suggested it to someone who was capable of turning such a hint into reality. Do you think that the boy will be very distressed when he hears about it? No, Rob, I don't think so. I think that in his heart he will be enormously relieved. 
his fear of her is much less than it used to be when he first came here, but he still sometimes says, promise that you won't tell my grandmother. She used to be a source of strength, which he misused, which he misused, the one who could enforce his childish threats. Now he has come to recognize that a woman like Kyoso Torres must always be our natural enemy. That evening I told Sanaset of his grandmother's death. He stood quite still, his face expressionless. Then he said, I don't mind, Rahab. It is a terrible thing to say about someone who loves you, but I don't mind that I am not going to see her any more. I almost think I'm glad. Is it wicked to say that, Rahab? How can it be wicked to be honest with yourself? It is sometimes meritorious to pretend that you are happy when you are sad. If by doing so you can stop your companions sharing a sorrow which is not in their power to lessen. But there is no virtue in pretending sorrow you do not feel. If you love her, you should not grudge that she has gone to Ra's country. And if you do not love her, why then should you regret that she has left the country in which you live? I wonder how she died, Rab. Do you know? Was she ill a long time? Did she have a lot of pain? She died in her sleep. There was nothing frightening about her death, Sanna said. It was only that one morning she didn't have to wake. I'm glad that it wasn't one of her own magics that killed her. Nakatan told me that the kind of magic she used to do, with black goats and crocodile blood in them, were very dangerous to the person who made them. I thought one of them might have turned back on her so that she died, as though she had tried to hold a cobra by the tail. Trying to change the subject, I said, do you wish that you were still living in the royal city instead of being one of the common people? No, Rahab, I never do. You won't send me away, will you? I'm getting better, honestly I am. I only very seldom get attacks of what Amini calls my awful royalness. I can feel them coming on. Like the, sh like the shivers before a fever, and I try very hard to stop, but sometimes I can't. I often try to think of myself as only me, not as the son of Pharaoh, or even as your kinsman, but just someone who hasn't even got a name. Then I get frightened as though I was going to disappear. I know it's silly, but sometimes I dream about it. At the beginning of the dream, I'm wearing a prince's scalp block and standing beside my father. It is some kind of audience, for there are hundreds and hundreds of people looking up at us. Then the faces go blurred, dissolve into mist and vanish. I put out my hand to touch the side of the throne, but my hand goes right through it, and the next moment I'm alone, standing in an enormous room without any pillars. I'm getting smaller and smaller until the lines between the paving blocks as are as wide as ditches, as canals, as a cleft between great cliffs and I fall into it and get lost. And I go on falling forever and ever. Then I'm suddenly awake and to stop myself being frightened, I say, Pharaoh is your father and one day you will be father of Egypt. You must be grand and important and not afraid anymore. Why do I have that dream? Perhaps it is because you still think of yourselves only in relation to other people. A crowd of faces turned towards you the throne beside which you stand. When those things disappear, you are afraid of finding yourself alone because you relied for your valuation of yourself on things which had no importance in reality. Though 10,000 people turn their faces towards you, they cannot add even a thumb joint to your statue. And though your blood is of the royal house, it cannot add to the nobility of your heart. Can't you stop me having that dream? I will try but you must help me, though you are already grown strong enough now to head your head heed the protection of rank. You are still uncertain of your own strength. You must grow confidence, confident in your own leadership, within the limits which your character justifies. The plan which I will suggest to you is not entirely my own. The original idea belongs to Armeni. You have already been several times to the exile's village. There, as you know, are the children who have come with their parents from other gnomes. When the parents are an indesirable influence on the children, they are temporarily separated from them, until each can benefit from the other's company. Some of these children go to live in a house similar to the one in which live our orphans. Others share the homes of people who are willing to take an extra child into their family. 
The exile's village is in the north of the gnome, the estate for those children who cannot be allowed to mix with others until they have learned our habits of life is in the south. There are six children recently arrived who had to make the journey south. I'm going to put three of them in your charge and the other three will go with Armeni. Each of you will have to lead these his three in the way you consider best. The journey should take you five days. At this season you can sleep outdoors and I will provide you with a pack donkey to carry food. Neither you nor Armini must say that you are my kinsmen. It is not an easy task I am giving you, for these children are wild and undisciplined. You will have only the strength of your own character by which to control them, for you must not threaten them with punishments other than those you can enforce without outside help. During the whole journey you will be responsible for their behaviour. And should they damage grain or other crops, you will have to make good the damage. But Rab, suppose I can't stop them breaking the laws. Suppose they don't listen to me. How can I make them obey me? Ah, Sanna said, that is for you to discover. How will you rule Egypt in three ordinary, if three ordinary children won't accept you as their leader? The owner of a dog is responsible if, unprovoked, it bites someone. The parents are responsible if their son becomes a thief. Is it then so surprising that the future pharaoh should be held responsible for three out of so many thousands of people? So this is the end of chapter six. Chapter seven is entitled Leadership. And I wish you a happy Tuesday, the 2nd of April.